understanding and and learning about ourselves has for some reason become split off from the things that we do and the lives that we live and so we're really excited by uh the potential in bringing those two worlds together and um what happens when you start really exploring your internal world what does that do for your sense of self what does it do for your relationships and you know what can it do for the systems that we're a part of and the world that we live in and I think we, we, both, we both feel really strongly that now is a time when the world is ready for that deeper exploration of what it means to be a human. And we, we feel like therapeutic work needs to be taken out of clinical settings and made accessible in our everyday lives. And so that's what we do and that's what we, we care about and that's what we love. Um, and we wanted to talk today about the education system and how we feel like that contributes to uh, that split uh, between what we do and who we are. And we would love for this to, we would love to hear your views and your experiences too along the way. So I'm really, it's really lovely to see your faces and, and to meet you all. Yes, that's really beautiful. I think that's exactly it. Is you know, how do we meet these two worlds that have been disassociated from so long? For so long, how do we get them to join in a way that serves us and all of us? Um, and I think this brings us, we wanted to start with a question. So you might want pen and paper, you might just want little online notepads, which is where in your life have you learned most about yourself? So if you could identify one structure, person, anything, there's, yeah. It's, it's a boundless question. Um, you can write as little and as much as you want. So I'll give you a few minutes. Okay, beautiful. So do you need a few more seconds? How's everyone feeling? Oh, amazing. We've got a jam board that's appeared. This is perfect. <laughs> Great. So I guess let's use that. Mm, yeah. yeah, so whatever you feel comfortable sharing on the jam board, or um, I was like, you know, yeah, if you would like to feedback, please unmute yourself um, and share. So I don't know, B, do you want to start? You can do an open share. Oof, yeah. Um... Yeah, big question, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it probably one of the, the main spaces is therapy. Um, I, I remember it opening up this space for me to think about myself and my life on a, on a whole other level. Um, and the other answer that comes to mind is kind of through all of the things that I've chosen to do in my life 
I've, <laughs> I've learned something about myself, like whether that's sports or, um, yeah, every experience has taught me something about myself, you know? Um, it's a bit, it's a big question. Yeah. Um, and then the kind of third answer would be my relationships. Um, I think they've allowed me to open up and part for parts of myself to be reflected back and for me to see parts of myself I'd maybe forgotten about or neglected. Um, yeah. So therapy, relationships and experiences. What about you? I think um, I think I, I would I would start with my relationship to a sort of spirituality. I think that because I was going to say meditation and that felt too too narrow, but it's something more expansive than that. But yeah, coming to um, a sort of a linear, like coming in touch with lineages. And for part of that for me as well was connecting culturally and ancestrally with something that I was very divorced from. Um, but that plus the exploration of my inner worlds in completely different mediums, sometimes the exploration of inner world that doesn't involve talking was really quite magical. I think I've learned so much about myself through that. And yeah, my first answer was everything. And I thought, <laughs> oh. God, I've asked a bad question now. <laughs> I'm not everything I do. But I think the thing I've learned, actually, where in my life I've learned most about myself are in things I've resisted and things that have I've come up against that have challenged me. Mm. Um, experiences I've had with people where I have been really angry or felt emotions deeply intensely. I think those, yeah, those experiences have taught me a lot. I actually think it's really interesting that we both went to everything and all of our experiences, because I think this actually shows a lot about how, about the education system, you know, which I think we want to touch on and how we kind of feel like that's the place for us to develop as people and to learn. Um, but actually, you know, what about learning through life and life experience when do we ever speak about that and the impact that has on us and how that shapes our sense of who we are um i think it's really significant you know <laughs> that we are kind of shocked by the fact that everything is in our answers <laughs> yeah it would be yeah it'd be lovely to hear what kind of came to to everyone else any examples Yes, Savandi. Hi, um, I hope my connection is clear. Um, I'm connecting from Sri Lanka. Um, so when you <laughs> um, so when you asked the question, what came to my mind? Oh, you've just been it's just gone on to mute. Yeah. Hold on. Go back. Can you hear? Okay. Uh, yeah, it was group work settings that I think I learned a lot about myself. Uh, I think in, in the beginning, I was not aware of the stubbornness I had in me of like things having to go my way or the highway. Uh, <laughs> and with awareness, I started to see the, the, the that stubbornness and that uh, uh, kind of... Uh, um, selfishness and kind of always thinking that I'm right and I mean it, that that stubbornness does have its purpose because it it has made me who I am and has kind of uh, made me the leader that I am in the things that I do but at the same time I'm much more uh, aware and I, I kind of see the, uh, the the way it arises and I'm much more reflective before I uh, act on things I'm, I'm giving more space to others to also come through uh which i haven't done in the past so yeah mm. that's so interesting so you're talking about group work settings and how it gave you a, a new awareness of yourself and parts that maybe you'd ignored or, or weren't aware of and i was just really curious as you were speaking at what point in your life did you um come across those group work settings was that later in life or when you were younger 
I mean, what, what comes to mind is from university, from start of university. Um, mm -hmm. I don't really remember in school. I mean, there were like teamworks like in sports and stuff, but um, I think uh, when it comes to like this academic environment and group work, I uh, I felt uh, that's that's where I think like where my mind connects back to like that's that's where it stops. I don't really remember from the school times, um, and then again that was also where uh, I started to like see myself again uh, much later because I was in academia for a long time, um, so I started to observe, and there were settings where I kind of had to like. Uh, I guess it was this the, the the start of my spiritual journey in parallel kind of helped me to see. I I would think like Ella said, if I didn't have that spiritual journey uh, emerging at one point, I don't think I would have seen it. Maybe I would have carried on the way I was. So yeah, I'm just more more reflective, I guess, and that you know self reflection was part of my academic journey as well. Hmm. Hmm. Beautiful. Thank you, Savandi. So it sounds like it was those, those moments of reflection that really allowed you that, that deeper sense of knowing who you are, learning about who you are. Um, thank you so much. Also, I was in Sri Lanka two weeks ago, so I feel very connected to you. Great. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And Anya? Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, I think what I'd like to share ties in um, with, with, with what was just shared in terms of um, going into reflection. Um, something that has helped me learn about myself has been um, shadow work. And um, it also ties in with the, with the spiritual journey um, that was mentioned by Ella as well. And um, just digging deep to those parts of ourselves that are normally repressed and um, uncovering where they stem from and um, really just uh, sitting with, with what arises in the body and what it's there to teach us and what it's there to, to reveal. Um, this was something that I wasn't necessarily aware of before getting into to spirituality and um, exploring it outside of Christianity because I grew up as Christian and um, coming out of that was oh, it was like dismantling so much programming and um, just realizing that we that there's so much more than than what I was taught when I was younger and taking that initiative to to really explore on my own and um, I've also taken on um, a solo traveling journey at the moment. I'm in Saudi Arabia, which is a huge cultural shock. <laughs> and um, it has been extremely eye-opening for me um, as an individual being on my own and it's forced me to learn a lot more about myself than I would have um, if I were back home with my family and friends. You know, it's not always an easy um, experience, but um, I'm so grateful for the lessons and everything that it's teaching me about myself because I know that um, once I come out of the stage, um, then I'll just have so much more um, weight in terms of self knowledge um, that I can take with me on my journey moving forward. Um, so yeah, just going deep into that internal work has been has been. Amazing. Thank you. I loved um, what I heard in that about that sometimes as well, exploring our internal world comes from exploring the external world. And mm. B and I were speaking about this the other day about this reciprocal relationship between our inner world and our external world. But sometimes it's the experiencing that can lead to an inner shift. And sometimes the inner shift leads to the experiencing. And sometimes they happen so together that it's hard to distinguish what I don't know if it matters what came first but it yeah. yeah it's hard to distinguish exactly what came first 
and I think I saw mm -hmm. that in Savandi's share and in yours and yeah but yeah that was really beautiful thank you thank you for putting it so beautifully as well <laughs> And I feel really excited for you. You know, I think there's there's such an energy to that experience of uh, learning about yourself on that deeper level. Like it seems to unlock something, you know, and I can feel it as you're speaking. It's yeah, <laughs> it's really beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Did anybody else want to share any any times in their life when they feel like they've they've really learnt about themselves or parts of life that help us to learn about ourselves? Yes. I'm just remarking on the yin nature of this session. I just got out of the technology session and it was like <laughs> full speed ahead, 100 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Very, very young. So, um, I, I would, I have my list here. Um, monastic and embodiment practices I'm vibing with everyone here. I think um, those have been incredible daily tools to learn about myself. Um, also just reading endlessly self-directed learning books, um, whatever I can get my hands on. I felt, I feel like that's always been a very safe way for me to get info about myself um and uh and then i would say trauma and suffering um has been probably the greatest teacher <laughs> um and uh the therapy that has come with that um uh relationships especially family close relationships like their our, our social engagement um, and the kind of feedback that we get from um, engaging um, has also been really important and um, doing difficult things, challenging myself to do things that I think I can't do um, and then finding out if I can do it and why or if I can't and why. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, I think sometimes I kind of do that the hard way. I, I mean, I, really it, it's really fascinating um my daughter last night when i were or the other night we're chatting and like right before bed in like those precious moments and she's was just kind of bewildered at why some people in the world act unkindly and i was like that's like the story of my life trying to figure that one out babe <laughs> so, Wow. So much wisdom from that little girl. Such a big question. Such an it? important question. Yeah. It's a yeah. question that I often think about. Mm. Yes, I was thinking, and often when I think I know, I, I'm bewildered again. <laughs> I think I have it. I think I'm like, ah. Oh, I figured you all out, people. I know why you do unkind things. And then they go and surprise me again. Linnea, is that how you pronounce your name? Linnea? Yeah, Linnea. I think she's gone. Linnea. Oh, no, sorry, I was thinking about Vivian. Um, we've taken a little bit of a detour from what we originally planned, but I think it actually happened for a reason. <laughs> and as I was listening to you, I wanted to ask you, and I guess other people here, how able do you feel, um, yeah, how able do you feel you are to express this in your everyday lives? Like these, these parts of yourself, does it feel hidden? Is it sort of like 2% <laughs> of it that you share or is it 80%, you know, how much of this can you bring into the external world and how much is reserved just for yourself and how much of it stays internally? Mm. I think um, quite a bit for me remains internal. Um, I'm coming from a journey of healing um, PTSD. And uh, I think that um, for the most part, I, try, I start safe. 
yeah be safe yeah. I, and I stay in that safety um I, I went through a time where I was very agoraphobic and the pandemic you know it just all <laughs> it all plays into all that so um it's really interesting I think any time where I feel safe to presence yeah then I do so joyfully <laughs> and so fully yeah um but getting to access that is the kicker <laughs> yeah and I, I think one of the things that I've learned throughout my life is that if you've never experienced or if you've rarely experienced a space where it felt safe to bring those more intimate moments it's of course it's going to be really scary and terrifying mm -hmm. yeah and it's so fascinating to see the impact and the you know the cognition and behavioral science research and you know uh, everything that's showing the impact of um early life traumas and trauma and how that plays in um mm. so fascinating mm. i think we really can know ourselves in a, in different kinds of ways than we ever really have before as a species and unfortunately that's quite shocking <laughs> but also hopeful <laughs> mm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just was reflecting on um, I've came out of the education system a couple of like the sort of forced education system a couple of years ago. God, that is actually how it feels. Um, and yeah, I was just really sort of struck by how that it doesn't feel like a safe place to bring yourself. It it never I don't and I think for a lot of people I know it doesn't feel like a you know, whatever you think about the way we educate, the modes we use, um, about testing, about the curriculum, like the energy, the atmosphere of it is very much one of, um, for me, it was very much one of conformity and what I wanted to fit into change as I, as I changed. But yeah, I, I feel like there's so much potential. I mean, this is what I felt like you touched on in there. It's a terrifying thing, but there's potential in there. There's potential for a great change and actually for like a, you know, a peeling of the onion for a, a getting much deeper into something that is already there, that is, we're touching on, I feel like still only surface level, this exploration of feelings, this exploration of, you know, all of this talk about mental health, the term that B and I talk about a lot because we feel like what does it what does it really mean what does it really encapsulate is that a helpful term you know we're not having that conversation yet in you know open spaces and we're certainly not having it in education I feel like you know it's it's still like oh wow this school has a counsellor rather than this school is facilitating a space for the young people to speak openly and truthfully about their distress to one another. Um, and if I can uh, speak on that as well. Um, I'm a teacher and I came to Saudi Arabia to teach privately for a family. And I'm teaching two young boys. Um, one is 12 years old and the other is 10. And um, the 12 year old, he suffers, or I don't wanna say suffers, but he struggles a lot um, with his mental health and with anxiety and the amount of pressure that has been put on him, not only from school and the environment that's created in the educational system, but from his parents as well, because uh, coming from a, a very successful family, there's, there's a lot of pressure for him to live up to that. And um, with me trying to incorporate these practices where he can become more aware of um, the feelings that are arising in his body when he becomes anxious before a test, for example, and trying to teach him uh, to teach him breathing practices 
to alleviate that stress and um, just to come back to himself and center and ground himself. Um, <clears throat> he hasn't been exposed to anything like that. So me even bringing it up, it's like, what's the point of this? Is this even going to help me? You know. So there's so much <clears throat> that needs to be dismantled. And it's, it's programming that has started from such a young age that by the time they come out of school, it's like, wow, there's so much unlearning that needs to happen here. Mm -hmm. um, in order for us to actually come back to ourselves and, and um, reparent ourselves in that way to create a, safe, a space of safety. Mm. And it's, it's really, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. And I feel like we're doing more harm than we are doing good in our current education system. And um, it really needs to be more of a norm for us to, to have counselors and um, incorporate this into, into our lessons every day. You know, mm. Mm. yeah, I'd really like to respond to that because this has been our mission with states of mind, the, the social enterprise we're a part of, is to bring these, this kind of curriculum of knowledge um, and learning to young people in their everyday lives at school. And um, we've been working with eight colleges, so 17 year olds, to bring in this curriculum that. You know, it includes so much from attachment to emotional regulation to all of this incredible stuff that we can learn, you know, that can inform our understanding of ourselves. And as I was listening to you, I was reminded of how in these spaces when I've offered them, what's come out of it is how the education system itself is the main reason for these experiences of distress. This anxiety and this depression is a direct result of the system and that's the one thing that we're really not speaking about um and actually you know from a school perspective they think oh we've got about you know 15 students who are being referred to mental health services at the moment but then sitting in the group you know 90 uh, percent of them are all struggling with really severe anxiety every day and it makes me think on a mass scale across the UK or across the world what are we doing to children by keeping them in the system you know and what are we doing to the nervous systems of millions of children and how long can this go on for you know without us really telling the truth about it and what you were saying about deconditioning, you know, it's real. I think that we can spend our whole lives trying to recover from the impact that that system had on our sense of self. I know I have. Um, and the, ironically, the children who rebel against that system because they really sense it and refuse to be a part of it are the ones that are excluded from society. Yeah. Yeah, and I was thinking, you know, we see I've been reading stuff, you know, about this art, uh, this mental health crisis mm. that apparently they're like, where's it come from? What's going on? Why is everyone so unhappy? And actually what we want to offer is a chance for all of us to really think about the fact that this is a product of the way we've been living. This is a perfectly logical outcome of these systems, mm. of an education model that tells you, you know, a a Frarian, I mean, Paolo Freire puts it absolutely perfectly when he talks about his banking model. You know, you absorb, you sit. There's no critical thinking. There's no dialogue. There's no space for reflection. And so even within those very structures, we are told that as individuals, we don't really matter. We don't matter in a really healthy relational way because we don't exist without our relationships. We don't exist without one another. And yet we live in a world, in fact, I would go so far as to say a whole world. <laughs> I would say that this permeates all of our systems that tells us that the individual is everything that matters, but you don't matter. Mm. And it's paradoxical, it doesn't make any sense. It's like, how can I as a rational consumer be the most important thing? And yet you've got me all wrong. I'm not a rational consumer. I'm a being. I feel things. 
I do confuse, I do things I don't understand all the time. I'm on a constant journey of learning who I am and who I am changes. And we don't, I, I, yeah, I would say that we don't live within an education system, especially, you know, the system that we're in for the first 18 years of our lives so intensely. And we're not lucky, you know, we're not all lucky enough to have someone like Anya who can introduce those practices to us or, you know, to have experiences that bring us into contact with therapeutic practices. And yeah, like B was saying, that's, that's the real mission of States of Mind is how do we bring these practices to everyone? Because this also is something that all of us are struggling with. It crosses all divides, actually. This deep unhappiness with the way life is. And yeah, it's, it's, I keep coming back to the thing of it being terrifying, but holding so much potential. I think sometimes the system itself, because it doesn't have um, any of this built in, it can't reflect on itself. Mm. So oftentimes it thinks that it's fine. Um, as someone who worked in higher education for about 15 years, providing accommodations to students with disabilities, it's 100% not fine. <laughs> um, and as someone who survived this, mostly survived the system, <laughs> is surviving, <laughs> uh, I think um, I can also attest, I mean, individually, each of us can attest in ways that it's just not fine at, at the very base level, of, you know. Um, and I uh, am really curious how in the UK it's been um, partnering with schools and um, if it was, you know, how you went about imagining the curriculum content and um, what some of those actions have um, looked like on the ground. Are you in America? I am, yeah. Are you hiring? No, <laughs> I wanna come work in. <laughs> I would love to work in the US. Yeah, I'm half American. So all right, well, let's get it going. Yeah. <laughs> There's some yeah. things happening, but not exactly like this. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, we should definitely stay in touch. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really interesting, the, the question of how did that curriculum develop and, and what did it look like? I think um, it developed over six years. Um, in conversation with hundreds of young people, uh, kind of 16 to 18 year olds about what they wanted to learn about. Um, a lot of that was how does early childhood experience shape our lives? Um, you know, it was, it was amazing having these conversations because it kind of, if people could hear it, it would just completely change their view of young people. Young people really understand trauma They've been through it. They're aware of it in their lives. They're aware of the impact. They just want to go deeper into understanding it so that they can shift that, you know. Um, but so often I see adults kind of seeing young people as these sort of mindless, um, I, I don't know, just like experience just happens to them and they don't really think about it, you know? <laughs> it's so strange. Um, but yeah, back to the question. Um, I, I think it was basically a combination of doing a psychotherapy training and thinking about what I was learning at the same time as what I was hearing from young people about what they wanted to learn and fitting that together. And it's been a, a constant evolution. Um, and I trained in psychosynthesis uh, psychology, which is a psycho-spiritual 
psychology it's just really beautiful um I think Ella Ella would agree it kind of just it speaks to these parts of our internal world that we know so intimately but never have a language to describe or you know express um and it gives this kind of really coherent framework of the internal world of the psyche uh, developed by this man called Roberto Saggioli um, around the time of Jung and Freud and the, the kind of humanistic uh, movement. And it just, wow, like you could just learn forever about <laughs> what it means to be a human being, you know? Um, and so I kind of tried to, with the curriculum, tried to make, Ella and I have both tried to make that as digestible as possible, um, but really practical as well, you know? So how can we look at our past experiences, our family environment, and how that shaped our beliefs, our ways of seeing ourselves? Um, how can we learn about the mind? How can we learn about emotions? How can we learn about our relationship to the body? You know, all of this is foundational for a healthy life and sense of self, but is also completely absent from the education system. Um, and to be completely honest, I, I've been shocked at how difficult it is to bring it into the system. There's only about an hour a week that's available and you can't go where you need to go in that hour. You get to this, the beauty of the interaction start emerging and it starts happening, but then a siren goes off and everyone clams up and is stressed and freaked out again. And I'm at the point now where I kind of, I think, no, like I reject that. I want to take this somewhere else and create a different place for young people to come to and be and create that alternative. That was a very long winded answer, but <laughs> I mean, there's something there. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking it reminds me of the um, 49th minute of the therapy session. Yeah. And you're like, I've got it. I've hit on what I need to hit on. And they're like, I'm really sorry, but you've got to go. Yeah. Five, five, minutes, five minutes more, but that's it. You're cut off. Yeah. And yeah, we've been, so this is something that we're exploring at the moment is, you know, how, how can we challenge the system? And there are projects within states of mind directly challenging how we um, like assess schools. And um, it's a really fantastic project called Breaking the Silence. Um, and selfology directly doing that within schools but also at the same time and I think this is always a beautiful thing how can we build how can we build up new systems alongside and within that that's an act of radical confrontation you know I'm saying we're saying look at this look at what we're doing right here right under your nose and so we're looking at that we're looking at that currently we're looking at how can we create a space for young people that isn't school how can we bring this how can we create an alternative for higher education aged university education education university aged people that was a really hard sentence for some reason um and give them a space where actually you can spend whatever time there is out of the construction exactly as we are saying of an hour a week which is all that they can give you because the school curriculum is so demanding especially yeah. for young children now as well it's so incredibly demanding that there's not time to think about yourself because you've got to be learning like seven different types of verbs and nouns um and how can we give them a space where actually you are learning about the world but you're doing that through learning about yourself yeah so it's percolating but yes Savandi, please speak um yeah so when you were talking about the, the british system um what I remembered was uh, I moved to England when I was 18 for my higher studies. And uh, um, so in, in Sri Lanka, I mean, things are changing now, but um, we have we have this culture of internalizing everything. And uh, I don't know whether we noticed it when she was in Sri Lanka, the, the influence of Buddhism and the, the temples and the culture around it. Um, so um, this internalization, this concept of karma, and that you're responsible for your karma and that it's uh, that uh, um, so nobody else is responsible for whatever you're going through that that kind of mentality that 
it, it's not i mean buddhism has much more of a depth than that but this is what is again like the the, the spiritual indoctrination is another level in sri lanka and uh, when i was in england and then i saw the support services and uh, how I, for, for me initially i was resisting it because it was like uh, it's it's a it's an excuse it's a way you know you should be like in charge because because i grew up in that system of you need to internalize it you're responsible and uh, and it took me like a long time to liberate from it so like how heavy these are on you and who you are as a person and how you treat others is uh, like you know it can be damaging and if you don't realize it you know that like like this this is the shift you know how do you shift when you have created so many people that think in a certain way you know it's you know especially in in sri lanka and then when you have this culture of karma like you mm. know it's it's your fault basically you know you did something in the past and this cultural context um and also i currently i on the ground i i try to with in the organization that i'm working which i have created i try to create a culture where i am transparent about my feelings and i kind of bring these things out and i try to uh bring my team into the conversations um and like try to be more honest and uh, to bring your feelings to speak about it but as a community organization based organization again we struggle with like um i mean at the moment these conversations are still in like group settings i haven't gone into like uh, one to ones i i just i think i'm not ready for that to uh, i don't have the training for that but in this group context uh, the worry i think there's this issue of trust you know how much you can open up and how much in the village your story would go so breaking through things like this in the rural context so i'm still working on that but uh, yeah like it's 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 very heavy is very heavy the structure that we have to break through mm yeah and it really reminds me of uh Carl Jung how he spoke about individuation and as the kind of greatest feat of human development kind of the ideal direction that we want to go in which is to know ourselves beyond the conditioning of society of our families and of the social institutions that really came to me as you were talking about you know that religious institutions can also also condition these very strong mindsets that perhaps are not ours um you know they they never really came from us in the first place and you can as you begin to question this you know what was mine what is truly me and what was cast upon me as the truth and that is you know that can be quite a shocking realization you know and i just really salute you for for questioning that and showing that actually you know these things should be questioned it's healthy um we shouldn't shy away from it um yeah i i feel like this is the kind of calling for us all at the moment is to really question this and come together and question it um i think there's so much potential there yeah i wanted to add in um really quickly as well that about the inflexibility and rigidity of these structures and linear mentioned it earlier you know that they that with higher education that it can't reflect on itself doesn't have the space and i think often i feel that about religion too and that when it does when it can reflect on itself it's beautiful it's fantastic it's a vehicle that's what it is it's a vehicle for learning about ourselves and that's what education could be as well um and i was thinking about one of my teachers um who's buddhist speaks about samsara as the system that you know what the buddha spoke about what the buddha wanted to escape from what the buddha wanted to decondition from samsara that is our system that's what what we speak about when we talk about the system whatever we mean capitalism schooling mental health all of that that's that's it that's the bind that's what's keeping us trapped in suffering and that that is a quite a radical interpretation of buddhism and a buddhism that's very engaged in social issues but that's part of it isn't it is can we step back and look with awareness and um aware of time 
right now. But, you know, we wanted to speak about, I want to speak about um, a Nib's question in a second, but we wanted to speak about um, what awareness does in all of this as well. And if we have time, I would love to do a practice, but I don't want to push this session. I actually want to just see where it goes. I'm really, this is completely not where we were going, but in so many ways, it's exactly where we were going. And I like that. It's really lovely. But that, yeah, when we question these conditions, when we question who we are, when we really, really dig deep, as Bea was saying, it can be really destabilizing. It can be absolutely terrifying. And we don't live in a world that support, you know, the education system doesn't support that. It, I was um, on the bus today. It's a really random story, but I feel like it relates. I was on the bus today and I was sitting next to an old lady. We're having a conversation about life and she's going to visit her grandchild at university. And um, we passed a village that she used to know. Um, and she was telling me how they've converted an asylum into luxury apartments now, but that one of the most chilling stories of this mental asylum was this woman who had been put in there at the age of 16 for being pregnant. That was the only reason she was in there because it must be insane to be pregnant at 16. I don't know what the worldview, and she died when she was 90. She spent her whole life in that asylum. And as she was saying this, she's going, oh, isn't that awful? And I was thinking, that's still what I feel the system does to us in less brazen, more insidious ways. It tells us for reasons that we can't understand, you, you're different and you need to be sent away. And we see this with the exclusion to prison pipeline. We see this with I mean, terrifying things happening in the world right now, but that that same system, you know, that same asylum mental health system that we can look back on now and say, that's awful. That level of self-awareness isn't there with our with the current system running. And it wasn't, you know, the people in the asylums weren't evil. Well, I don't know, evil's a big word, but you know, they I don't think they all genuinely were like, we hate these people and they need to go away. But there is an inability to step back from the conditions and the systems that we're all participating in. And I think this is what this is what I think the power of all of the awareness, which is what we've been doing today, we've been being aware of ourselves and hopefully our bodies as we've been speaking felt a lot of tension and a lot of release at a lot of different points in the last almost hour. Um, but yeah, that this very act of awareness is an act of resistance. That it's saying, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna be what I'm being pushed to be. Exactly as B was saying, it's an act of individuation. I'm, I'm gonna, oh, I really want to share a quote, but I can't remember it. So I'm going to look it up and share it later. Um, but it's about freedom and about freedom being when we are all free to be ourselves in a way that is communally healthy. I think there's something so beautiful about that shift between individual want and what we all need. And for so long, I feel like, like I feel like the education system pits the two against each other. It's like, you know, you can't really do, you know, when you're younger, you're told, oh, you can do be whatever you want. And then you get a bit older and it's like, you can't really be whatever you want. You've got to go into the jobs that we currently need. And actually there's a way to follow your joy and give. I really, really think that. And I think that's something, yeah, that are, that's a, a really, really relational aspect of life that this current, this system does not respect. And I think this really links back to Anik's question about how do we, the question is, um, would you also like to share about the assessment in such a space, this, these spaces we've been talking about, how do the learners become aware of their progress? And I think that 
one of the projects we're doing at the moment, which Ella started to speak to, is students are designing an alternative Ofsted evaluation framework. So in the UK, we have Ofsted, which basically um, assesses schools and gives them a, a measure, outstanding good, needs improvement. And they obviously have their standards by which they judge a school, and that shapes the behaviour of the system. Um, you know, and this is essentially the grades that a school produces, you know, that, those outputs. So the students are redesigning what should be evaluated. And this gets really difficult, you know, <laughs> when you start thinking about how do you evaluate the things that matter to us, but are harder to measure? You know, how do you evaluate relationships, the quality of relationships? <laughs> Can they be evaluated? Um, but what's coming out of it are values, essentially. So things like teacher autonomy, uh, student-teacher relationships, well-being. Grades, when you ask students and teachers, actually come pretty much at the bottom of the list. They're much more interested in the development of the, of the child. Um, and, you know, I just, I wonder how much is that need for assessment actually part of the conditioning that we've all grown up in? that for something to have value, it has to be able to be assessed and there has to be a box that can be ticked. And Anip, I'm sure, you know, you're not coming from this place, but it's worth thinking about, you know? Where is this fear coming from that if we don't assess something with these metrics, that all hell will break loose, you know? Um, and I just think it's really interesting that this session we've had has been very unstructured, um, you know, there is that that yin energy of, you know, what happens without when we're not attached to the outcome. Learning can still take place, you know, and learning very has really taken place here. I've learned so much more, I think, than if Ella and I had tried to really stay within a rigid framework. Um, I think that we can assess it, but those measures look completely different to what we know now. They're not exams. Yeah. And I think, because um, my answer is going to be pretty much the same, do we need to? I think it's, it takes more time. But I think one of the best ways, because we're always learning, you know, especially with this model, like we might speak to people for a certain length of a practice, um, might have six weeks with them, but the knowledge and that you know, the, the process of self-inquiry that might be initiated never stops. It might go underground for a bit, but it always, it continues for the rest of your life. And so I think I found maybe the best way to assess is just to speak, is to sit with people and speak about how they feel they're doing and what they feel they've learned. And, you know, is that like, I'm always reminded of this bias that I still feel I see in academia of quantitative over qualitative research and it's actually like but how I mean words can only express so much but they express so much and I feel like we don't always recognize that and really understand that people are complicated but they do often tell you what they mean yes exactly listening sessions working groups focus groups all of that all that really deep trying to understand what is happening for another person um, and in terms of metrics, we've, you know, that we would put out sort of surveys during and after to figure out, are people happy? Are they, you know, what do they want to change? So there's a constant checking in rather, oh, perfect timing <laughs> for the feedback form. Yeah. You know, are people happy? <laughs> what do they like? What do they want to change? What do they not like? Um, but just also really being open to criticism. Because that's one of the things I feel about our assessment mode isn't open to. It's not open to somebody coming forward and saying, I don't like this. I don't want to do this. Um, yeah. 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 Is everybody happy to go for an extra 10 minutes? Okay, beautiful. Lovely. We just see where it goes. But yeah, I think it'd be nice to have a bit of extra time. Um, but yeah, I was thinking, I don't feel like our systems are even ready, like let alone, you know, the assessment isn't ready and the whole system isn't ready for a criticism that actually threatens it. Um, 
I was thinking about two things, about the fact that students at Goldsmiths, which is a university in London, have been striking and the university managing body has threatened to withdraw all of the students who've been striking. It said, no, I can't cope with the fact that you want a democratic, free university education. You can't go here anymore. Um, that's, that's the question, isn't it? Is it criticism or feedback? But it's criticism to a system that can't take anything that's not that, you know, you're doing really well, you're doing slash, I'm too scared to say anything truthful. Um, I'm thinking about, like I've recently dropped out of university because I'm really deeply unhappy with, I felt incredibly trapped by the system. Um, and I spoke to my academic advisor about it. And one of the things she said, she said, all of the students who make me grateful to be an academic advisor leave because they don't want to do this. And it's horrible. And I was like, oh, thanks, bit of an ego boost. I'm one of those students, but you know, the, that, <laughs> That's the truth of it, is that the people who universities deeply need, most of them don't want to stay there. They don't want to be there. And we're having this conversation with her own. She's recently, she's come back into academia and she was saying, I don't know how long I can stay. But there's something, there's something so powerful that like academia is a, it can be a beautiful place. And it's not, and part of that is to do with the conditions that they work in. The conditions that we live in but it's also to do with yeah the way that these paradigms and systems intersect and are just repressive in every way shape or form and I think when that comes down to it it's like we as individuals are not being given the space to express our fullest selves and if we can't do that in the most basic of our systems, then how can we expect the people, you know, actually on, the, on some level, this is just coming to my head, you know, how can I expect the people in positions of power to do that, to show up honestly and authentically when I don't feel like I can show up honestly and authentically? And how can I show up honestly and authentically when they're not? It's the same reciprocal thing of, and that's why that this is, there is that power in bringing as much of ourselves as we possibly can to the world and challenging this because that act inspires, it inspires this ripple effect that you can't measure. It just, yeah, it has this incredible effect on other people's lives. You know, I was thinking of the one thing that I'm taking away from this session. And for me, it's how destabilizing these spaces of reflection are to these coercive systems. You know, it's fascinating that that's exactly what they push out and don't allow in are these spaces for reflection. But it's also the one thing that can actually contribute to their growth and their health. And I feel like it's kind of up to us actually on a grassroots level to start creating those spaces. We can't wait around anymore, <laughs> you know? Um, it's time to kind of take back that, that power that's already within us and not wait for any institution to give us permission. Yeah. But yeah, I wanted to share another, um, I just feel like Bell Hook says everything that I ever want to say in the world and just says it better. So. I'm not going to try and say it, I'm not going to let her say it, but this, right, you know, in an ideal world, we would let all learn in childhood to love ourselves, we would grow, being secure in our worth and value, spreading love wherever we went, letting our light shine, if we did not learn self-love in our youth, there is still hope, the light of love is always in us, no matter how cold the flame, it is always present, waiting for the spark to ignite, waiting for the heart to awaken and call us back to the first memory of being the life force inside of a dark place, waiting to be born, waiting to see the light. I think this speaks to exactly what you just said, that this is, it's an individual, it's a communal and it's a structural journey, but it has to happen on all three of those levels at once. Yeah.
that's such a powerful way to end. Sorry, yeah, there was a question there, Ella. What three levels yeah. are you referring to? I would say in if I had to describe them, I think it's much more complicated this, than this. But I'd say individual, community, and structural. And obviously, all structures are made of people. So it's like it's like a circle, really, more than levels, isn't it? And they all mm -hmm. feed into each other, don't they? And that's what I love about sessions like this, because it's like we've all come together within a structure of the conference mm. as a community right now, as individuals. We've all brought our own things, but we've created an entirely unique space and unique energy. And that's like, that's so, and that's what I experience when B and I do trainings or when we, lead any of these sessions is that it's always different and there is no standardized model that could work <laughs> it's so true but it's so magical as well it's just oh it makes you i'm so excited that we do this it's like wow <laughs> what a good choice like what a beautiful thing yeah human beings are beautiful <laughs> you know in their essence it's a shame that we don't create those spaces to witness it more mm. yeah thank you to everyone for bringing yourselves yeah you're beautiful people <laughs>